failure is okay. Thinking that way is okay. And how you get up is what matters. How you deal with those thoughts is what matters. What's up, podcast listeners? I'm so stoked to bring Morgan Stewart back to When the Cleats Come Off. Hey, Morgan. (laughs) Hello. Hello. Man, I've been wanting to do this conversation forever. Like as soon as we finished our last conversation, I was just like, I can't wait for conversation number two, strictly because we dabbled a little bit into mental health and defense club, which you started, which we'll get into. Um, But you're just so honest about your journey and your story, especially regarding mental health, um, that I feel like this this conversation is going to be a fun one and it's going to be one that people can learn a ton from. So I'm happy you're here. I'm happy to be here. Um, I, I'm excited to just get deeper because I think it's what people crave, especially when they hear the words mental health. Mm -hmm. Um, If anybody struggles with it or even just the mental game, uh, knowing where it's coming from and kind of the context around it, I think is really important. Yeah. I agree. So if anybody hasn't listened to the first episode with Morgan, you may want to just jump over there to understand um, a little bit more about her softball journey, because that was one of the first questions that I asked. So we talked about her travel ball journey and then all the way all the way to playing at Washington and winning a national title. She talked a ton about defense because you're super passionate about that. Um, But we also that's where we dove in a little bit to defense club and working on the mental aspect of the game more. So my first question for you today is just how, how was that, that journey through mental health for you? Can you, can you kind of like take us from when it started taking a toll on you to almost just that journey of where, where it started and and kind of where it took you and, and why now you're deciding to help athletes through this process process as well? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think hindsight's 2020. So as I, my, in my version of the story, um, I didn't think it's my mental health journey started until I was a junior in college, Mm -hmm. but looking back, I think it was kind of building up. Um, and, and I created kind of an environment for this to be an issue for me starting probably in middle school. So I remember, I mean, I was a quiet kid and I'm not saying all quiet kids or shy kids or, or people like that ever develop mental health issues or have a problem, uh, with their self-worth. But, um, that was a thing for me in middle school. I coming from elementary school, I was a popular kid. I was athletic. I was always picked first. I was a team captain and kickball and basketball. And I just kind of knew my role and going into middle school, I super retracted on the social scene. I was I was in travel ball, softball, so I had those friends, but at school, it was just interesting for me. I uh, had, I developed like these two new friends that I had known in elementary school, but um, were kind of antisocial, like I wanted to be, and I just didn't feel like my, the other friends that I had in elementary school understood me, and it was just a weird time. Like, and I think everybody kind of goes through that weird, awkward phase and not knowing where they fit in. That Mm -hmm. was definitely me in middle school, got to high school. And I was definitely more known as like, Oh, Morgan's like going to go to college and play softball. She's the sporty one. And I had more of an identity just in sport, uh, got to college. And this is the first time that I had faced any real adversity. Right. Um, My freshman year, it's always going to be different. So kids that are graduating from high school, going to college, there's always anxiety, there's worry, there's unknown, there's fear. And I had a decent freshman year performance performance wise. I was introduced to a lot. Um, When you go to college, there's a lot of different things that you see that you've never seen before. So coming from, and I wouldn't say that I was sheltered growing up, but I definitely was pretty straight edge didn't do anything I wasn't supposed to do, got straight A's, took AP classes. I was ready to hit the road. Right. And, um, I thought I was completely prepared, but there were just things that, uh, influenced me in college, like being around drinking, being around going out partying. And like, these are things that I thought, okay, this is the normal thing to do. 
And so that kind of influenced uh, me feeling a little bit unbalanced, not because I was a super partier, but, but because I thought, okay, this has to be part of my routine and part of something that I do now as on the social scene. So that was freshman year, sophomore year, kind of got back into, oh, I don't need to do what everybody else does. I'm going to focus on what I need to do. That was the year that we won a national championship. And then my junior year, um, I felt like I had a bunch of expectations on me. We had seven seniors graduate from that championship team. And I was now an upperclassman. I was a junior. Uh, it came out that I was a preseason All-American. So this is these are just normal things that happen. I had a great World Series. I was now one of the older people on the team. And because Danielle Laurie is on the team, we were ranked number one in the nation. And so there's expectations. And I, uh, for some reason, even though everything was going my way, that season, I just felt the pressure and I buckled. And I finally just, it seemed like all of the self-worth issues, all of the, uh, the feelings of doubt about my hitting is going back to middle school. Uh, I had a coach that said that I would never hit in division one. I, I would never play in the pack because I couldn't hit. Uh, and this was when I was in like 12 and under, like, wow, these are things that coaches think that they can just say, and their mm -hmm. kids won't ever hear about them, but then they do. Um, but yeah, uh, my junior year, we started in fall ball and I could not hit. And I kept thinking, okay, I'm going to get out of this. I just got to go to work. I got to watch film. I have to get reps. I have to talk to my coach. And yeah, that was, that was the start of me thinking that it was a physical thing when it was really so mental. And that's where kind of the idea of defense club came from of, I think that my issue, my junior year started as the mental game. Definitely mental game. Like you're in a slump. All right. How do you deal with it? How do you recover from failure? How do you create that resiliency persistence and get back into competitive mode instead of like angry, sad, frustrated mode, right? How do you flip that? Um, and then when I didn't have any skills to support my mental game, I started kind of fading into this person that uh, didn't talk to her parents or family. I lived in California. I was going to school in Washington. So I kind of backed away from my family because I didn't want them to know that I was having a tough time, backed away from my teammates. Uh, I was super stubborn with my coaches because I didn't want to make these weird adjustments that I've never made before because I know how to do this. I can do this myself. And I was just that person. Yeah. And did it feel like weakness? Like is it was a weakness talking to your coaches about this? It felt like I was failing over and over again because I didn't know the answer and I couldn't be even strong on the outside at a certain mm -hmm. point, like talking about it, I would get so upset. Yeah. So that's when it started shifting into a mental health thing for me yeah. because I got depressed. I had anxiety when I was playing and that's, I think that is a big thing that athletes deal with is not just being able to work on their mental game, but knowing that, Hey, if we don't fix this problem and it's just going to wear away at you because your identity is so closely tied to you as an athlete and you as perform as a performing athlete. Um, and I don't want to scare people because I think some having mental health issues is like a predetermined, uh, thing inside of you. Right. Uh, but it definitely was the case for me that it led to some mental health, this whole journey that I've been on for sure. Yeah. Wow. Well, I want to thank you for being so vulnerable with that story. And I know it's probably, like you said, you don't want to scare anybody, but I think every athlete deals with their own type of anxiety or nervousness or trying to fit in at some point in their career. And I'm, I'm getting a sense that you started defense club simply because you want to help the athlete who doesn't know that it exists yet, 
or even the one that's in it, but like try to help the athlete before it happens. So she knows what to do when it does come, come to them. No, absolutely. I, I mean, my ideal person that I want to help is those kids that are like 12 to 14 years old that are thinking, okay, I'm having all these feelings. I'm having all these thoughts. I'm having doubts, but I'm going to hold it in because nobody else is really talking about it. And I'm just supposed to be going to practice and doing school. Like I got it. I don't need to go to my parents and ask them for help. I don't need to talk to anybody about this. I got it. So defense club is literally made for those kids that are not even to the point of struggling, just thinking these thoughts are so normal. (laughs) Like that is, that is the message that defense club is trying to express is it is okay. If you feel like you're not confident right now, you're not supposed to know who you are yet. You're not supposed to have this super concrete identity. You're not supposed to have all the confidence in the world, it grows with reps, with experience. Um, And so just having that message very clear is failure is okay. Thinking that way is okay. And how you get up is what matters. How you deal with those thoughts is what matters. So Mm -hmm. that's the biggest thing. Yeah. And and it sounds like just putting in the reps on the non-softball specific side and putting in the mental reps are how it starts getting easier to get through something and you can't put in the like if you don't start like you'll never put in any reps and you'll basically come and just be like I don't know how to get through this so what are some like mental reps that athletes can start taking maybe now to if they you know whether are are experiencing anxiety right now or depression or any of that um that can or if they're not like what can they put in now Mm -hmm to get in some reps. Yeah, that this is huge because I think the idea of starting something is so daunting, right? Mm-hmm. Like yeah. if an athlete is going through this and they're just like, Oh my God, I have to start something else. Like I already have to do weight lifting. I already have to pack my own lunch in the morning or whatever they have to do during mm-hmm. their days. These kids are so busy. It's insane. Uh, but starting can be as easy as just being aware of what your thoughts are. And that Mm. sounds so like Zen meditation, yoga, like all that stuff. But you guys, it's been around for hundreds, maybe thousands of years for a reason because it's necessary for growth. So in terms of starting, it can be as simple as, all right, at practice today, I'm, while I'm taking reps, I'm going to take maybe 10 minutes out of practice and just notice what I'm thinking when I'm taking my reps or notice what I'm saying to myself before I step in the batter's box and not judge it. Just go, Oh, I didn't even realize that I was like that. My chest is kind of tight when I'm stepping in or that Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, okay, just don't strike out. Don't strike out. Don't strike out. Or what am I thinking? Right. That is the biggest thing in just practicing awareness Um, And then how, like kind of understanding the story that you're telling yourself and what I'm going through right now, um, I call it like ASAP training and this, you can see this, it's right on the defense club website. So uh, acknowledge uh, is the first A, right? Acknowledge, it's acknowledging failure, but we're just kind of taking it back and just kind of understanding what you're thinking and yeah. what's causing some of these feelings. Mm. Um, and I would just say that that would be number one thing is understanding what you're telling yourself every single day, because if you don't understand the kind of, if you're putting in negative reps, it's like, I mean, you're a hitting instructor. Uh, all right. You're telling people to get to extension. Mm-hmm. And if people don't know that they're literally just swinging the bat with their arms like this, how do they, how do they know that they need to make an adjustment? Right. So understanding where your starting point is, is huge. Yeah. And I, it's funny you mentioned this because I I think of when, let's say I tell an athlete to go to extension and she's really having trouble doing it. I really, I just asked a simple question of what did that feel like? And then when they're like, I don't know what it felt like. I just start asking them questions like, Did it feel like you made contact close to your body or far out? Did it feel like your shoulders are over that ball? 
And you just kind of prompt some questions of what it should look like. And if they say, no, actually it didn't feel like that. And then you give them advice like, hey, if you're there, simply just work on, you know, staying behind the ball, getting the ball out front, just simple cues. So you're saying that there's basically a way to communicate with athletes, to give them cues to think about, and then go over those thoughts that they're going through in order to make a change. I'm saying that mental practice is obviously just as important as physical practice and mental practice. You can make adjustments just like physical practice. So those yeah. cues are going to be a little bit different and probably harder to feel for athletes because they can't just look in the mirror and go, what am I thinking? <laughs> you know, they can't, they can't right. look in the mirror like they can to get to extension. Okay. Are my palms facing up? Are my, are my elbows bent? Or are they straight? Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, one of the things or the next step, uh, in ASAP, right. ASAP spot your defensive personality. Uh, there's a quiz that I have on my website as well, that they can go through, take the quiz and it will pop up three different personalities, which I should probably update this. Cause I know that there are more than three personalities, mm -hmm. but, um, one of them is the escape artist, right? Uh, if you take this quiz and you, it populates, all right, you're the escape artist. You're the girl that, uh, when you fail, you just don't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. You, you back away from everybody. You go to work. You, you just, you want to get out of there. You don't, yeah. you don't want to talk about your failure. You don't want to dissect it none of that. You don't like, you don't want to face it. Right. Yeah. Is there shame and involved so, there? Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> I I'm, I'm an escape artist. So I basically describe myself. Uh, you don't want to admit that you did something wrong. You don't want, especially because you've worked so hard at doing it right. That when you don't perform, it's like, Oh my God, I'm, really a failure because I actually really wanted to do well, right? Mm -hmm. It's, and so you'll see anyways, uh, in terms of adjustments, when you're, in what you're talking about, if you kind of identify as this kind of personality, what are ways that now that you know that you do this, how can you combat that? All right. If I'm an escape artist, I don't want to talk to anybody. Okay. Why? <laughs> mm -hmm. Why? Just like you said, all right, all right. Are you ashamed? Are you afraid that somebody's judging you, your coach, your teammates, your parents? Um, and what adjustments can you make? You don't have to go up to them and say, Hey, uh, are you judging me? It's not the kind of adjustments we need to make, but in our mind, we're making, we're flipping, uh, our mindset instead of being nervous or scared or, angry that people are judging us, right? You just go, you know what? These people want the best for me. If, if I have, if this is like really a feeling that I can't get past, maybe reaching out to somebody is going to help me. That's good. So that's A, S, A. What's the next A? A is activating defense. So in this step, right? Maybe reaching out to people is, is something that you do. Maybe journaling about your feelings is something that you do. And that's another thing that people have always told me to do. All right. Hey, journal. Maybe you need to understand what you're going through a little bit. And as an athlete, I'm like, I don't need to freaking journal. Like, I don't need to do that. I know what I'm going through. I don't need to read it again. Uh, but in the moment, a lot of these thoughts can be super detrimental to you getting over a failure. Mm -hmm. Right. And you just don't know all the things that your mind can do and it can snowball and just make it worse. So activating defense is just, uh, implementing some way to make an adjustment. Right. And these ways can change. If journaling doesn't work, try something else. If listening to a pump up playlist doesn't work, try something else. If doing a defense club course and understanding what are the things that you might be saying to yourself instead of negative thoughts, affirmations, right? Like visualization, doing different activities that can take the place of negative thoughts are super helpful. Mm -hmm. um, if any of those aren't working, 
change it, right? This is where we, we are trying to create a routine and a pattern for ourselves. Yeah, I know everybody talks about journaling. I have my way of teaching journaling. How do you teach an athlete how to journal? Uh, one of the easiest ways is to have kind of a template and just have, um, we do this for the ASAP training. I'll just write out ASAP. All right, what are you dealing with right now? Like either is it the feeling of being anxious? Is it, and why are you anxious, right? And they just write out, all right, this is what's going on. Spot our defensive personality. What's basically, what's the thing that it, that's holding us back? Because the A might be, yeah, I'm really anxious that uh, my parents are going to watch me play and I'm not going to do well. Mm. But, and then, so that's kind of the thing that we're dealing with. But then the personality trait is, and because I'm nervous, I'm kind of not going all out or um, I don't, or I'm not swinging as hard as I can or whatever, whatever the way that they're dealing with it and kind of like unhealthy is a, not a good word, but in a way that's not letting them be their full best self, they're dealing with it in some way. Mm -hmm. And then the next A is, all right, how, what are we going to think differently? How are we going to pivot and shift our thinking or what are we going to do differently, even physically, that's going to help to alleviate this anxiety or what I'm doing, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe that could be um, having a conversation with my parents before we get to the game going, hey, I'm kind of nervous to play in front of you guys. And even having kind of an open conversation, that's something they also always talk about in Defense Club. Having this open uh, dialogue is so healthy between parents and kids that even that can lift a lot of anxiety. Yeah. So having a conversation or going, hey, mom and dad, just for like the first inning, can you guys sit in the outfield instead of right behind home plate? It's like a lot for me, right? Um, and then P is, that stands for practice. So do, or getting reps with this mm -hmm. same thing over and over. And that's so critical. And even if you adjust, what your second A is that activate defense, even if you adjust what that is and still get some reps doing it, then you'll be able to know what works for you and what doesn't. It sounds like ASAP is basically just a practice plan. Like it's literally when you feel out of control, when you feel like you can't control anything at this point, especially your thoughts, ASAP is basically just, here's how you can control what's happening. Here's how you can see it. And it's all written in front of you. And what I think is kind of cool about journaling is like when you do that practice once, the first, the first time is the hardest simply just because you're like, okay, how do I feel these things? How do I know what my thoughts are? But like, once you do it once, you now have a game plan or a roadmap of how to do it again. And then like, as you keep writing more, you're fine tuning how you're thinking and how you're adjusting. So if you ever do go back to a previous thought or um, feeling that that was negative, Oh, I've, I've gone through this before and here's how I got out of it. You literally have like the tools in your, in your toolbox that you've created on your own. Um, exactly. Cause we, we listen to so many people talk about, all right, mm -hmm. how have you been successful or why are you confident? And somebody's answer could work for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I just practiced every day and I did this and this and this amazing. Like listening to Lauren Hager speak or Sierra Romero speak or like, I don't know, just anybody that just seems like they exude confidence. Lauren has completely different personality than I, than I would. Mm -hmm. I can't like, I'm just not her. Right. So if I was to listen to her speak, it's kind of like, oh, okay. Well, I don't think like that. So uh, I, am I going to be successful doing your own practice and creating your own flow like that? I think it's, um, it puts the steering wheel back in your hand, mm -hmm. right? Totally. Totally. I've even related to that so much. I see somebody like, and even in like a different, like 
they, they do something totally different than what I do. And I look at them like, well, I could never think like that. I don't know. And I can't even relate to this person. But it's like, as you're doing this, you're creating who you want to be by going through this. You're like, okay, well, I got through this. And simply by going through it, you're going to feel more confidence just because you're like, wow, look at this. Look what I did. I can like see it. Um, that's awesome. And I really love talking about journaling. Um, and like on the other side too, whenever an athlete comes to me and says like, I had my best weekend ever. Like the first question is, did you journal about that weekend? Because if there are athletes that I work with, we work on journaling all the time. They're like, no, I didn't. And I'm like, well, how are you going to remember what worked? How are you going to remember what made that happen? If you don't write it down, like, what is it? You're 70% more likely to remember something if you write it down. Mm -hmm. Um, that's why, you know, you can use journaling on both ends and they're both extremely effective if you do it, um, correctly. So I, I love journaling and I honestly, I didn't even do it in college either. Like my coach gave me a journal and goes journal. And I'm like, okay, why? And then all of a sudden I start doing it with some of my athletes and they're figuring out their own problems and they're looking at what they've accomplished. Um, you know, when they hit their first home run, going through all the things that happened and now they're feeling like, wow, I could do this again. And they're just, I don't know. I, do you ever think as a coach, like your goal is to make athletes not need you at some point? Like that is definitely my goal. Cause I, <laughs> I mean, every coach that we've had, I mean, we're not currently playing for them anymore unless mm -hmm. we've asked them, Hey, can you be my mentor? Which I've been, I only bring that up because I feel like I need more mentors around all the yeah, time. Me too. Um, but yeah, eventually our coaches go away and, and not because we don't like them anymore. We don't need them anymore, or maybe because we don't need them anymore, but we move teams or we grow up or we stop playing softball and yeah, absolutely. If you're a coach, I want to get as much information as I can to my kids uh, until I can't see them anymore. And that's exactly why I felt like I needed to start defense club as soon as possible. Uh, no pun intended there, but um, because I felt like there were so many kids that were getting my physical side of defense, like, all right, we got our fielding position dialed in. We got glove work. We got footwork. And it's so funny when you actually talk to the girls and they go, okay, what, what's, what do you get out of, out of lessons or hanging out with, with, with me or, or the P or the girls in their lessons. And some of it is reps and practice and getting better at softball. And 50% of it is I love building relationships. I love the friendships that we make. I'm building my confidence. I'm learning how, how to have better presence. And it's like half of what you come here for, we don't, we work on it, but it's not in my practice plan. Mm -hmm. And I want to devote so much more to it. So I don't know. It's just, it's super important to be able to uh, communicate those things, I think. It totally is. So you mentioned the three personalities. I'm just really curious what the other two personalities are. Oh yeah. Um, so the three are escape artists, which I already said rage machine, which mm. is, uh, we all know this person because it's the one that we don't want to be around after they strike out. They'll eat, they kind of wear their heart on their sleeve. They're super emotional. They will throw things. They'll cry. They'll yell. Um, if you have a rage machine that ever plays first base after she strikes out, she's firing ground balls in the warmups. And you're just like, dude, don't make me look bad over here. <laughs> that's so, so true. That's, I never thought about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that's rage machine. And then yes, girl, or yes, person, because defense club is not just for softball players. It's for all, all sports, but yes, girl is uh, somebody that they, they strike out and they, they try to have no emotion or they keep smiling or something, right? Coach brings them over and they're like, Hey, you're doing this and this and this. And they're just going, okay. And you know that they're just angry or sad or kind of taking everything in, but they, they know they can't go anywhere, but they're not really listening to the adjustments. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, those are the three. And it's interesting because 
I'll have people uh, take this test and a lot of people that do defense club are escape artists. <laughs> mm, yeah. Um, because they're attracted to you and, and what you, you put out there too. Yeah. So, so I hope, I hope that more of the different personalities come on in, but it's, it's cool to have kind of those, those three different people represented. I do think that, uh, like Lauren, that I keep using Lauren cause she's like, top of mind because I just talked to her about this but she took it she's like I, I'm not any of these I'm like yeah I know I like, see that now because because <laughs> when because when you take the test it it's like all right when you strike out do you go to the end of the dugout and don't want to talk to anybody do you listen to everything that your coach says even though you're still thinking about swinging and missing do you throw your helmet or yell at a teammate for being in your way or something, right? And all of them are like so extreme, except for like, okay, obviously escape artists, right? That's like the most mild one. But Lauren's like, yeah, I don't do any of that. I just get on the fence and I like start cheering. I'm like, were you always like that though? Like at your weakest point, because that's where I think I'm trying to hit these kids or athletes Yeah, is, in like, what's your instinct? Even if you don't do it right now, right? What's your instinct? Uh, do you just not want to talk to anybody? Do you want, do you want to throw your helmet or are you listening, but you're not really listening. Right. So yeah. she goes, Oh, so how I would play when I was 12. And I'm like, yes, what? Mm -hmm. Of course. Yeah. So then we, we got to it eventually. That's funny. <laughs> you know, as you describe these, I think there's also like a denial person like someone that's in denial, like how could that happen? Or it was somebody else's fault. Like it was the umpire's fault for calling. Like, I feel like there's that athlete too. I'm just thinking about what I've seen. Yeah, too. no, I, I need you to take this, this <laughs> quiz. Cause I think, All right, I think happening. I put that. Yeah. I put that under rage machine. Like you blame somebody else and you yell, yeah, at them. but I, yeah. I do think that you're right because there are some people that are like, Oh, it wasn't me. It was her, or it wasn't me as the umpire, like whatever. Yeah. And that's, you're not being super passionate or angry about it. You're just like, well, I don't have any responsibility. So deflect. Right. right. That's so interesting. Um, could you be a mix of two? Cause I'm thinking yes. of my game and I, I think the escape artist and the rage machine, like sometimes I would get so upset, like, especially when I was at my worst, my rage machine would come out. Um, and people were like, don't talk to Ashley. And I had like, you know, one or two people that I could talk to in that situation, but everybody else was like, uh, uh, I don't want any part of that. <laughs> but, but I yeah, do, think I was I mean, also an escape artist like you a little bit too. No, I, yes. Uh, that is part of like the technology that I'm not in charge of, of being like, oh, you are equal parts, all three of them. I need to work on this quiz a little bit more, but right. I, I want you to, to, uh, take it as is and see what you get. Yeah. I'd really, I'd really like that. I'd have to put myself in like a college, my college self, at least to try to see, mm -hmm. cause sometimes it was just, you know, a mixture of all three. Um, I love that. So you mentioned like at your, when athletes are at their lowest of lows, do, do you have a specific moment that was maybe your lowest and how did you get out of that? Uh, my lowest was probably, uh, it's tough. Okay. So we were ranked number one all year, my junior year. Right. Mm -hmm. And I didn't hit literally all year. Yeah. And, um, we got to the world series and we were two and out that year. And after the game, I have never done this in my entire life. I walked up to my dad and I sobbed, sobbed crying in his arms. And I remember feeling guilt doing it because uh, why was I so sad when I could have done so much during the season? Like if we, like, why was I so sad? If I could have just gotten a couple more hits in the world series, we wouldn't have lost. And I felt guilt doing it, but it was almost like I couldn't help it. I had been holding in so much and I just lost it. And 
even though it was done, it was over that release of crying with my dad. Um, I'll remember it a lot forever because I, I know that my parents were worried about me all year. Um, I know that there were other players or parents that I was afraid of like seeing this happen, but I, I couldn't help it. So I, that was like the start of my recovery, quote unquote, because it was at least I was letting somebody be there for me. Yeah. So I guess it was, that wasn't the low, but I just, that's a, like a memory that I will have forever. So the low part, I guess, is just going, going through that and feeling like I couldn't be around anyone because I didn't want, I didn't want to break down. I knew I had to keep going or quote unquote, knew I had to keep going because if I didn't practice, if it was just going to get worse. Right. So I thought I was the only one that could do anything, which I'm right. And if you're an athlete listening to this and you're going through a stump, a slump, you are right. You are the only one that can get you out of it, but it's going to be in a different way than you think. It's not going to be because you're going to get one miraculous hit. Even if you're telling yourself you suck the whole time and you're afraid to strike out the whole time, the way that you're going to get out of it is by flipping the, the order of this. It cannot start with you getting a lucky hit. It starts with you going, you know what? I'm going to do this. I'm going to freaking do this because I don't want to waste any more time. I'm wasting time feeling sorry for myself, not talking to my teammates, not sharing this experience with my family who got me here before, before I sunk into this rut and going back, like, that's my biggest regret. I felt like I wasted a year of being able to, I mean, for girls playing softball, this might be their dream. I mean, some people might go and play pro or have a goal of playing on the team USA or in the Olympics, but for probably vast majority of people playing youth softball, playing in the college world series is their dream. So yeah, my lowest point was when I felt like I didn't have anybody that I could talk to, or I didn't have any different tactics to try. I just thought I'm doing everything I can and it's not enough. And that's a scary place to be. Mm -hmm. I would not want any other player or especially young softball player to deal with that. I'm glad you mentioned your family in that situation because, you know, I know a lot of athletes right now are with their parents every day and like Mm -hmm. their parents are always around them. This is why when the cleats come off exists because Coaches can only be with athletes for a couple hours a week, if that, but parents are who's with them outside the white lines. Um, I know in college, like that's not the case. Um, it's mostly your coaches and your teammates. Um, but let's, let's talk to parents right now who are always around their athlete. What are some signs that maybe in that, in that point that you were in or something similar that parents can look for, um, to maybe see something that they didn't they don't normally see from their athlete that can kind of help them understand that they're going through something right now. Um, signs and parents know their kids way more than a coach will ever, but I know that I get this question a lot. Um, one thing is after a performance, good or bad, um, how, how is your athlete, right? Like after a good performance, does she want to talk about the game or is she quiet, right? Does she want, does she want to talk about softball? Does she want to talk about different things? Like how is your athlete after a good performance? And then how is your athlete after a bad performance? This could be obviously very simple. And um, uh, I guess my point is, is your athlete, kind of absorbing everything after she fails or doesn't have a good game where the team loses? Is she super quiet? Is she super mad? Like what's the difference there? And ideally after you get off of the field, we should be in a neutral state. Mm -hmm. That's, and when I say should, it doesn't have to be that way. Maybe parents want to relive the game a little bit and talk about and talk about the game, but listen to the language of if she has a bad game, I, 
I need to do that. I, I needed to get that hit. I needed to do this uh, versus I wanted to, right? The difference of the language um, is something to just be mindful of. And it's not this, this uh, scary thing of like, oh my God, you're using the word need. Uh, we gotta get you help. No, it's just when you hear that, um, the word need, or I have to is tied to kind of identity, right? That, that feeling of, I need to do this or else people are gonna look at me different. I have to do this or else it means I fail. Mm -hmm. I wanted to is more of the story that you're telling yourself of, I want to do this, but if I don't, it's okay. And this is where we get, uh, where it's hard with the line for elite athletes. Because I know that when I was growing up, I didn't want anybody to say, hey, it's okay if you don't, if you guys don't win, it's okay if you don't get a hit. I'm like, no, it's not. It's just not. Right. And that's and that's something that is like so in competitors. And it's okay to want that so bad. Uh, but there is a line between thinking that you have to do something because it makes you you and you want to do something because you're a competitor and you want to do your best mm -hmm. so establishing that and understanding that or I understand as somebody that's gone through it and someone that's kind of had been tough on her parents especially my mom and I remember her language and she would always just go Hey, just go out there and have fun. And I'm like, it's not about having fun. It's about doing my job. Right. And I remember this kind of language in my head and just kind of discounting my mom and going, ah, you, you don't even know, like you weren't yeah. even an athlete. And it, it like, I feel bad voicing it now, but I know that kids are thinking this because I thought it, and I didn't say that to my mom. Like maybe I did when I was super upset. She's like, Oh my God, just, you're fine. Ugh. No, it's not fine. I spent hours doing this one skill and I can't freaking do it. Like, what does that say about me? Right. And in reality, kids, one, need to realize that their parents know a lot more than they do. <laughs> and it's, it's hard to communicate that and have kids believe it. Right. And two, as parents, um, instead of just leave it as, Hey, go out, go have fun out there. Right. That can be a triggering thing to some kids. Cause it's like, you yeah, know, I'm not trying to have fun. I, I, this is like what I do every single day now. Um, maybe shift the language to like, Hey, need or want, do you need this? Right. Do you need this to be you or do you want this? Because it's going to make the experience more fun, right? And it kind of levels up that just the one-liner of a parent with such good intentions, right? Because what are sports? We have to have fun in order to learn and to get all the lessons that we, that we want for sport and in life. Mm -hmm. We have, I mean, what are the sports that, that most of us like? I mean, I like the sports that I'm pretty good at and I have fun at sports when I'm doing well at them. So if you say have fun, it's pretty much like, Hey, go be great because you're going to have fun when you're doing well. Um, it's just, I know I'm not, I'm definitely don't know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about parenting, <laughs> but in terms of talking to a kid that is stubborn and that doesn't want help and thinks that their parents don't know what it's like to be a travel ball player that sacrifices weekends and takes themselves super seriously. I kind of know what I want to hear and what I don't want to hear. <laughs> yep. I, I feel that to my core, you mentioned parents having the best intentions for their kids. They do. They always do. I have a question about something that you've probably experienced because you're a coach just like me. What do you say to the parent who they say, well, we're coming to you because she won't listen to me anymore. And uh, you, you say something, you coach them, you cue them on something. 
and the parents saying, well, I've said this a hundred times to them. I've said this so many times. Again, that parent has the best intentions in mind, but do you think that verbiage is hurting or helping your athlete? Um, it's different for every athlete, but in that case, if they're saying that sentence to me in front of their daughter, most yes. of the time I'll go, yeah, they're right. Listen to, listen to your parent. Yeah. You know? Um, and then I'll say maybe two different things of like, this is how I explain it differently. So it kind of clicked for her. Maybe you guys can work on this at home. Mm -hmm. So it's what anything that I teach, I want to be able to teach the parent and the kid. It's not yeah. just my secret relationship with the kid mm -hmm. of, all right, this is how we're going to get better. Don't tell your parents, right? Mm -mm. No, this is a collective thing. We cannot get better unless the parent kind of knows what to look for when they're yeah. taking video, when they're rolling around balls, when they're pitching front toss in the backyard or what, however they're getting their reps at home. Uh, it's not really going to happen if the parent's not bought in. And most of the people that are coming to us for lessons, they're already bought in, mm -hmm. right? They, they understand the value. Um, but yeah, in that case of, oh my God, I've, I've told them this a million times. Um, it's tough. It's tough, but I get it. Like, I don't want, right. when I'm a kid, I don't want to listen to my mom or dad. Like, I don't mm -hmm. think that they know anything about softball, but they've been to a lot of lessons. So there's things that they remember that maybe you didn't, or you forgot. Yeah. Do you recommend parents being there at lessons to pick up on the things that you're teaching them? hundred percent. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, the only thing I would, I would think is like, once they get to like 16, 17, 18 years old, unless it's a super position specific lesson, and they're just getting reps. A lot of those girls are literally there for like the social aspect of like having a, having a relationship with the people in their group and getting reps, but younger than that, definitely for sure. Yeah. I, I completely agree with that because especially, I know my dad is always eager to learn. I mean, I was the first born, like he wants to, he wants to help me as much as he can. Um, so we can work on those things at home. I think there's, there's a, there's a lot to say when parents are so invested that they're there and they're able to take that knowledge with them and still use it with their athlete, but also it kind of helps your athlete know that you're a team, you know, like, I, I know you mentioned this before we started recording about how parents should be all in on their athletes goals too. And it really, you know, I know as an athlete, like. I never really saw it this way until I was older, but my dad was my teammate. Like my dad was my biggest fan, wanted me to succeed more than anything, whatever that meant. Success is different to everybody, but he wanted, he wanted my goal just as bad as I did. And I think just that subconsciously as a kid, knowing that it helped, you know, the hard days be a little easier because my dad knows that like, we're going to do something to make sure that that error doesn't happen again. Or, um, you know, just, he's just there, you know, I, I don't, I don't really know where I'm going with this, but like, how big do you think it is to have their parents in on their goals with them and be a part of this process? I think it's huge. I think, uh, how you described your relationship with your dad, that's something super special. And I don't think I don't think the majority of kids have it. I think some kids do because I can see that relationship in some of my students. Mm -hmm. um, but I can tell you that as much as my mom or dad wanted to be that person, I did not let them, right? I, I wanted to do it like that. And that was my personality as a kid. Mm -hmm. It's like, I want to do everything by myself. I wanted to be self-sufficient. And that was, that was just me. But probably if my parents had maybe pushed it a tiny bit more, maybe I would have had a different attitude about it. But I, I did feel like I was, um, one, I wanted to do it on my own. And two, when I didn't have that person to like help me with different things that I worked on in lessons, because I went out there by myself, I did feel like kind of the world was on my shoulders. If I don't figure this out, like it's on me. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, 
And I think practicing the mental game that it's huge to be able to talk to your parents and bounce different uh, goals that you're trying to work on with them. Because I mean, I'm 32 now and probably in the last two years, uh, I've finally started kind of letting my parents in and it, that it's, I mean, I'm still on my mental health, like, and I guess work version of the mental game journey, mm-hmm. um, even now, but I think if I would have kind of voiced different goals for my mentality with my parents and they would help me help hold me accountable, I would have gotten better that much, that much easier. Cause mm-hmm. just imagine how hard it is to practice physical skills by yourself and not have anybody be able to say, Hey, remember your coach said this, you're kind of doing that. Right. Um, and mentally no one's holding you accountable except for you, unless you're having these conversations of, Hey, all right, let's, let's go through your ASAP journal. Right. And that accountability piece I think is, is helpful. Mm -hmm. Uh, It can be, um, or it might be for kids, another step, but as parents that, especially parents that are maybe a little bit worried, uh, about anxiety or kids being hard on themselves, maybe just having that more teammate mentality would be really helpful. Yeah, I think so too. You know, I never, again, I never thought of it that way growing up, but that was big because it's like, it's not just all on me, but I do believe if we're being honest, that it did almost bring this type of negative mentality when it came to, sometimes I try to please my dad with my performance because he was my teammate. You know, I know a lot of athletes are like trying to please their parents or they're trying to please their teammates. And like, that's, that's where they get caught up is like trying to please other people. Do you think that they should start doing it for themselves more? And like, how could they practice that? if that's the case? Um, that's, that's a tough question because I think that a lot of us play sports for the competitive nature. Right. And when we're being competitive, we have to have something to compare to a little bit. Mm -hmm. And if that's our performance in front of other people, I think there's a healthy amount of that when we're talking about sports, Mm because there's not really a sport that you're going to play that you have aspirations to play where you're not playing in front of other people and you're not I mean, you want to look good in front of other people, right? Um, I think what really matters is if you don't perform and you fail, what is, are you punishing yourself for that? Like, what's your relationship with, with those people that you're trying to impress? Um, if you're trying to do well in front of your teammates, your coaches, or your parents, and you have a negative feeling when you're doing it, that's something to address. But if you're mm-hmm. doing it like, all right, this is, this is my thing. All right. I know he's watching here. I go, like I'm going all out versus, Oh my God, he's watching me. I don't want to do this wrong because we're going to have to practice like a million hours at home. Right. That's, a, that's probably something to address. Yeah. It just depends on how you look at it. Yeah. I mean, there was a stern moment in, in my career. And I, I remember saying this on the podcast probably twice at this point, but it was, I think I broke some sort of record at Purdue and my dad was there. And I was like, dad, like I did that for you. And my dad was so pissed. He was so mad at me. He's like, Ashley, why on earth would you do that for me? He was so mad. And I was just like, oh, what do you oh. mean? Um, and then it's funny, like, as you're describing this, it makes you think of, well, after that moment, I kind of looked at it in the way you just described as, okay, there's all these people in the stands. Oh, dad is here. Okay. Let's, let's put on a show. Like, let's show that, let's show them what we've been working on, you know? And if you don't get it done, it's like, okay, I still have another opportunity to do that. And maybe that's why my career from that, you know, significant moment kind of went the way that it did, but you're right. Like there was a part of me that was like, it kind of got rid of trying to please dad. And it was just kind of like, instead of pleasing him, it's like, let's put a smile on his face. Let's go. Like, it'll be fun. And then like looking at it in the other light, like what could happen? What could I do in this situation instead of, oh gosh, what could I screw up in this situation? Um, wow. 
I love where this conversation is going. Like I, <laughs> I, I had no idea we'd go here, but I just love it. Um, I know you wanted to mention a couple um, things that parents can maybe say to their athlete to build a stronger relationship. Cause I can't tell you how many people listening are probably wanting, you know, parents wanting a better relationship with their athletes or even coaches wanting a better relationship with their athletes. Um, how, how can they kind of build that bridge piece by piece? What kind of conversation should they be having? You mentioned a few of them and I, and I guarantee if some, if parents are going to go do that, um, that'll help their relationship, but is there anything else that they should know to kind of help um, yeah. Um, like I mentioned before, I think a, a big conversation to have is like need versus want. Yeah. Right. Like let's have awareness around that. Um, another big one is, uh, and I was struggling to, to voice this before the call even started and kind of condensing it because the language could either like be a trigger for your athlete, or it could be kind of a, a conversation starter. And I think before you ask this question, just saying like, Hey, I think you're doing great. I'm really proud of you. Um, I just want to make sure that you're, that you're still loving softball. Right. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of parents ask me when kids are dealing with burnout in this COVID season or the last two years, it's been like, Oh my God, these kids are going through a lot. So I don't know how to kind of handle it. Um, if they're struggling, just having the conversation and having that be the starter instead of like, Hey, are you okay? Most kids are going to be like, yeah, I'm fine. What do you, what do you mean? Like I have to go to practice. I have to do my homework. Um, and, and it depends on your relationship with your kid, but I know that if, if it was me, um, this, even this conversation would kind of just put me on like, what are we doing here? Like, are you trying to analyze me? Are you trying to <laughs> like, are you trying to get me to not play softball? You know, I'm, I would be defensive. I would, mm -hmm. but like, if you start off like, Hey, you're doing really great. Your grades are awesome. I'm really proud of you. Whatever the case is with your person, with your player or daughter, and then, Hey, just want to make sure you're still loving it. And I think if I was a kid, and I was having a tough time, I probably just be like, yeah, I really like it. I do like it, but I don't like messing up. I don't like spending hours on things and then it means nothing. So that's like probably a huge thing that parents might hear. And, you know, at least it's a conversation starter, right? Um, instead of having those feelings kind of live in their athlete. And it's not that they need to talk about them, but at least the parent knows where they're at. Mm -hmm. And I think even too, just asking, okay, if, if they're willing to go deeper, it's like, okay, what do you love about it? Like, what do you love about softball? What do you like about softball? And then one that's going to boost their mood. Cause you'd be like, well, I love my teammate. Chloe and I love getting the RBI hit and like getting them almost excited to talk about it. It creates an environment where they're willing to share more. And maybe after that conversation, you're like, okay, well, what are some things you don't like? And like, same thing like you're saying, maybe just creating an environment for them to talk. Is no, absolutely. And I think, I think one big thing that a lot of kids or parents, something that is, um, there's a block in communication is parents don't want their kids to play softball. If the kid doesn't like softball. Right. Right. <laughs> right. And like all the parent wants is that the kids learning great life lessons, the kids happy and the kids just learning how to do something that's hard while also understanding that if they fail, it's okay. Like, it's mm -hmm. not going to change you as a person. That's the parent. Most parents are on that in that line of thinking. I agree. Most girls want to do well because it makes them look better and because they they like softball and they like doing things that make them feel good. Okay. Um, and I think having this conversation is going to do, could do exactly what you said. 
it's going to kind of boost them and remembering, okay, why do I do this? Why do I love it? Mm -hmm. That's, that's a huge thing in creating that awareness. And it's like, okay, I got, all right. I might be doing bad right now, but like all these things I love about it, I'm in, you know, like I, I, I can do this week. Yeah. (laughs) Or on the other side, having this conversation and a kid goes, you know what? I really don't like it. I really don't. And then the parent goes, oh, okay, let's try something else. Let's get you into something that you love. And that's not, and I'm not the person that's like, yeah, give up when it's hard. It's not what I'm saying. It's the kid that's pushing really hard, has been through a lot, et cetera, et cetera. You know your kid best. I am a hundred percent for the grind and working hard and all that. But if the kid is just like, man, I really want to try like art or skiing or something else. Oh, okay. Right. I think, I think parents, most parents don't want their kid to do something that they don't enjoy, especially when they're paying so much money to do it. Mm -hmm. Totally. I can't, I've heard a couple instances where, you know, their kid gets to that point where they're like, we can call it burnout or just, they don't enjoy it anymore. And, you know, their kid takes a year off and then the next year they're like, I miss this. And then they come back with like a, like more of a fire and more of knowing what their why is. And then they're playing their best softball because there weren't other things trapping them that, that were there before. So, you know, taking a break from something is not a weakness. It's actually a strength. Um, and some kids I bet need that conversation. Uh, I agree a hundred percent. And I know that there's kids uh, here that are afraid to take a break because they'll lose, lose their spot or other kids aren't taking a break. And it's just one of those things that you are still kids, uh, you know, like breaks are okay. It's not gonna ruin your whole softball life to take a little break. Yeah. I mean, even like a week off for some people is not even like a thought, but it might be exactly what you need. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's why I always think like coming back from the holidays is always exciting. Cause like we, you know, didn't, didn't practice. I'm thinking about college right now where the fall was so strenuous. We were lifting so much. It was so hard. And then we get, you know, a month or so off. And then you're almost like more hungry when you get back. Cause you're like, okay, like I did work on some things over Christmas to like, just work on some little things, but also it's almost season. Like the anticipation's there. It's like, they're more willing to work on it, but I don't know that that's not really like a break. Cause I'm still working in between, but it's enough to like have enough time to work on the things that I want to work on, work on, you know, have full control over my practice schedule and then come back and be like, okay, let's do this. Let's go in a national championship. <laughs> Which no, you actually did for, yeah, no, I think it for sure is a break though, especially like and why does that work? Why is like that part of the schedule of, so- of softball? Why don't they just keep like for summer break, football guys are in there like, cause they have to practice cause it's almost their season, right? Why does that break of Christmas even exist for softball players? Why aren't they made to keep practicing? Cause the season's so much closer. Oh, because we've been working our butts off all this time mm-hmm. and our bodies kind of need to heal a little bit from maxing out in the fall in weights and being there every single day, it does work to actually have a change of, all right, I'm going to work out over here (laughs) and uh, I'm going to take a break from being around all these people 24 Mm seven, just a little break. And then I'm back in it. Right. Yeah. We all can learn from that. We all can do that. Even I think about work now, like I know we're not players anymore, but I need to do that more with my work. Same, (laughs) same for sure. (laughs) Which you, you just described to me a a great break you took this weekend, but, um, it is a thing. Everybody needs a break sometimes. All right. Tell me how people can, can learn from you and defense club. Like where can they go to have access to the ASAP quiz to Mm -hmm. uh, personality quiz, things like that. They can go to defenseclub.com. Uh, there's a lot of free stuff to explore, right? Uh, you don't have to pay to look at the personality quiz or learn about ASAP training or to just even start on your journey on your own, right? Uh, Go over there 
and maybe just get your bearings. That's what that's what I would do. I would probably sign up for the email list because I've got some emails that go out that just explain what Defense Club is, what our goal is, what our mission is. And parents that are listening, um, what do you got to lose, right? Uh, if you're interested in this conversation right now and so if some of the things I've said or that Ashley said has been like, oh my God, that's my daughter or that's me or yeah, I wanted to learn more about this. Defense Club is just introducing a lot of these mental concepts. We don't um, go super hard into any certain thing just because it's like an introduction into it. I'm not a psychologist, but I bring in um, like Katie Cheadle was just on for one of our live events. She's doing a course on the line between the mental game and mental health, which obviously I'm super excited about. Uh, but she's a performance coach certified and she does uh, therapy for, for kids as well. So really excited. So yeah, my website, I start to ramble about all this stuff, mm -hmm. go to my website and check it out. No, I think every parent, if you are interested in this should at least just have your athlete take some of those quizzes and go see what the results are. Like I bet parents would be so surprised to see, um, you know, which personality your athlete is. Because you may know, but you may not know some things about them. And I think, like you were saying, the more there can be like conversation around this, the more you know each other better, like this, the easier this process is going to be. So go check that out. I want to make sure all of the links that Morgan just talked about will be in the show notes. I also think I'm just going to include, we've had a couple other mental health conversations and Morgan's old episode will also be in the show notes for you to refer to as well. But Man, I'm so I'm so happy you're here. I'm so happy we could dive deeper into this. Um, but before I let you go, I want to ask you five rapid fire questions for five to throw. Yes. You into it? Tell me. You nervous? Yes. Um, no. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, let's start with this one. I know how much you love working out. And how often is workout a stress reliever for you? Every time I work out, I feel better. <laughs> me too. Every time. <laughs> Me too. I knew, I knew that'd be a good one. And it's just ironic that you just came from a workout before hopping on this call. Um, yes. And I feel great. <laughs> I love it. I love it. What's the go-to song for you to listen to when you just need a boost? Oh my gosh. Um, one of my favorite songs right now is the bones. Uh, this one. I'm going to show you, Ash. This is like a random song. It's not like a, uh, like an athletic song. <laughs> uh, the Bones, Marin Morris. And I like the one, how do you say their name? Hoosier? Who, who's? Anyways, their combo duet. It's really okay. good right now. I may, have to put, <laughs> I may have to put that in the show notes too for everybody that's interested. Um, I love that. It. I and everybody uh, has like a ooh, song or two. Look up, look up Lake City Drive. I just discovered these people. Hmm. Lake City Drive. I think that's what it is. Yeah. They've got some good stuff on there. I like them. All right. I like it. Ready for the next one. I like it. <laughs> um, what's your favorite or top like go to rep? Like if somebody is dealing with, anxiety right now would be, I know you said like the first thing would be assess, but like, do you have like a favorite rep that you feel makes a very large impact? Maybe it's journaling, maybe it's, you know, other types of stuff. Do you have a favorite? Move, uh, just like the workout, right. Help me move or not get away to forget what you're going through, but when your body moves, it talks to your brain right? Like mm -hmm. we move, we release chemicals in our brain that helps us feel better or just gets our mind off of just ruminating on the same thing. So I would say move your body. That's a good one. I, I oddly enough, love going on walks with my dog for that reason. Mm -hmm. Like get your thoughts out. That's so good. I have to do it. I love that. Do you have a favorite sports movie? And what is it? For the love of the game. Yes. I like that one. I mean, a league of their own, obviously is classic. 
everybody probably says that one. Yeah, I mean, my senior quote did come from a league of their own, but for the love of the game is that's a good one. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go watch good. it tonight now. Uh, love it. Well, before I ask you this final question, I just want to thank you once again for coming back on um, and sharing your journey a little bit deeper, being vulnerable, but also for the impact that you're making on the game. Like you are literally teaching athletes something that you wish you would have had. Um, and, you know, honestly, I wish I would have had this growing up, these opportunities that you're providing. So you're kicking butt, Morgan. <laughs> well, thanks for having me on. I, I mean, obviously I like talking about this stuff. So anytime I will come back and do it again. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Everybody should go check out Morgan's stuff. So last question that I'm going to ask you is what's one piece of advice that you could give parents of athletes that are going through this tough sport? One piece of advice for parents um, would be, man, uh, I'm not prepared. Let me see what should. I think to just trust themselves that they know their kid. You know, you you do know more than you think that you know. Even if, like, as you're going from 12s to 14s to 16s to 18s. It's like, I see parents go from like rec ball to travel ball and they get so stressed and they, they're just like, ah, oh, I know we need to go to this workout and this workout and this workout. And I think the coach wants her to do this. And it's so much that I think just listening to your kid and having these conversations is really important. Even if your player is like, oh my God, it's like not a big deal you'll be so thankful that you've like had these conversations and you know where she's at. So even if you're stressed and you don't know what's going on and um, you guys are navigating it together, I think is really, really important. But I think biggest takeaway is like, you know your daughter and trust yourself. I think so many of the conversations that I have with parents are like, I don't know what to do, please help me. And most of what I do is I'm confident in what I say to your kids, just because I've been there. You should be confident because you've known her her entire life. Like you, you do know what to do. And most of the time it's just like, Hey, are you, are you still loving this? Why do you, why do you like this? I support you go do your best that's it. <laughs> Beautiful answer. I love that. And I love you, girl. Thank you so much for coming on. And we'll probably have to have another conversation just like this. one. Yeah. Anytime, anytime. This is always so fun and you're very good at asking questions and getting all the information out. <laughs> um, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on.